UV and its Role in the Origin of Life by Tom Hendricks Introduction Life, the origin of life, or OOL, is more likely to start if it had a 99% chance of starting than if it had a 1% of starting. So most likely the OOL was 99% likely, not 1%. For me, the turning point to the study of the OOL is that life is not a fluke, but the most stable chemical reaction to the environment. Though this proves nothing in itself, it may adjust the mindset in OOL investigation that now seems stuck in a rut. Ultraviolet light and its role in the origin of life. Introduction. A number of recent studies suggest that ultraviolet radiation may be a necessary ingredient in the origin of life. Further, one may hypothesize that the daily solar cycle and the sun's UV radiation were important in all stages of the origin of life on Earth. Moreover, it is suggested that life can be defined as that chemical reaction forced by the energy cycle of the sun under very specific circumstances. Evidence. In support of these claims are the following assumptions and lines of evidence. Number one, the assumption that all stages of the origin of life took place at or near the surface and close to or on land. Two, the assumption that there was a lower solar luminosity, higher UV flux, and no ozone layer in the period of the origin. Three, the assumption that there was a shorter diurnal day-night cycle due to the faster rotation of the Earth following the presumed collision that preceded the formation of the Moon. 4. The assumption that chemical selection was for stability under the sun-heat cycle. 5. The assumption that solar radiation far exceeded all other energy available for organic synthesis, including electrical discharges, shock waves, radioactivity to a depth of one kilometer, volcanoes, and cosmic rays. Six, the assumption that there were wet-dry cycles that drove phosphorylation of nucleotides and perhaps other condensation reactions. Seven, the assumption that there was a first, a primitive, environmentally forced, PCR-like, replication process of alternating heat and cold that denatured, then annealed, RNA paired strands. It is assumed that the sun cycle, day and night, caused a cycle of primitive denaturing and annealing of paired RNA nucleotide strands and possibly folded, annealed, and unfolded, denatured, nucleotide strands. It is assumed that this provided a large number of variations of paired RNA strands with variations of properties, the most stable of which possess the best Watson-Crick pairing. 8. It is assumed that instead of a self-replicator, there was at first a primitive sun-forced replication process. It is assumed that proofreading would at first have been limited to WC pairing over non-WC pairing for stability. Note also the assumption that paired bases may have better protected the ribose phosphate backbones from UV damage. 9. The assumption that the first coded information would have been for that molecule which was most stable in the sun heat cycle environment. Note, in Watson-Crick base pairing in RNA, there are two sets of nucleotide bases. G bonds to C and A bonds to U. It is assumed that Watson-Crick base pairing is more stable in this environment than non-Watson-Crick base pairing. And of the two sets of bases, it is assumed that the GC bonds would have better, more stable, have been more stable than AU bonds because C, G, GC bonds have three hydrogen bonds instead of the two of AU. It is also assumed that AU would have been more stable than non-Watson-Crick base pairing. Further, it is assumed that high GC base pairing would have supported more stability than high AU base pairing. Additionally, it is assumed that AU base pairing would have supported more stability than non-Watson-Crick -Watson base pairing or no base pairing at all. 
It is also assumed that high AU base bearing would allow for more variation than GC base bearing because AU bonds are more likely to, de to denature in heat and more likely to denature quicker than GC bonds and thus more likely to anneal with other RNA strands in cooler temperatures. It is assumed that overall the GC plus AU sets of nucleotides would promote both general stability with the GC set and variety with the would promote both general stability with the GC set and variety with the AU set of nucleotides. 10. The assumption that RNA acts as a, as a receptor and transducer of UV radiation. 11. The assumption that there was a cyanobacteria-like lifestyle style for the earliest confirmed true organisms so far and that this earliest remnant of life is very near the likely origin of life. 12. The assumption that there were pyrimidine dimers impact on the generic code. It is assumed that because of the high UV during this period, UV caused pyrimidine dimers would also be highly likely. This further assumes that this would not favor any code with adjacent pyrimidines that would lead to the likelihood of pyrimidine dimers. This further assumes that this most that the most likely first codons would be either purine, pyrimidine, purine, or pyrimidine, purine, pyrimidine, coding that prevents adjacent pyrimidines and thus pyrimidine dimers. Later, it is assumed that this would lead to information coding beginning in the second position or middle position, the most protected, protected position of the three base codon and anticodon. It is assumed that this initial coding may have been limited to to two classes or sets of amino acids, hydrophilic XAX with A in second protected position, and hydrophobic XUX with U in second protected position. There is also the assumption that there was a pyrimidine dimer impact on tRNA, which is further assumed was one of the earliest forms of RNA. 13. The assumption that the Miller-Urey experiments are seen as an illustration of a heat cycle energized by a cyclical electrical discharge apparatus to represent UV radiation from the sun. 14. The assumption that this first mechanism that used sunlight energy to remove hydrogen from water may have been UV radiation on ferrous ion. Magnetite, a mixed oxide of ferrous and ferric iron, found in banded iron formations, or BIF, may be remnants of that process. I'm going to take a drink of water. This hypothesis avoids problems in competing theories. Number one, the problem that heterotrophic lifestyle styles rapidly deplete the soup of nutrients, thus forcing an implausibly rapid invention of photosynthesis. Instead, it is assumed that life started out on a phototrophic path rather than having to invent it in such a short span of time. 2. The problem of self-replication. It is assumed that RNA would not at first replicate on its own and would need some kind of environmental energy forcing it to replicate. It is assumed that the sun cycle would provide planet-wide forced energy daily. It is assumed that it would provide stable but variable energy that could force into existence a replicating chemical system by denaturing paired RNA strands in high temperatures, then annealing single RNA strands in lower temperatures. 3. The problem of UV as a major detriment to the origin. It is assumed that UV would no longer be seen as a detriment to the origin of life, but instead as a necessary component of the origin and a necessary part of the selection process during the origin. 4. The two problems that hydrothermal vent scenarios have. A. No assumed necessary drive phase component for condensation synthesis. And B. No assumed necessary UV component. The sun is a more stable, longer-lasting, 
energy source in any event, especially if the origin occurred during part of the long bomb bombardment phase, a bombardment that would have upset the constancy and stability of most vents. Also, the sun does not sterilize the water through high temperatures like the vents do. Number five, the problem of how the complex mixture of necessary molecules for the origin of life came about. James Lovelock has said this regarding the claim that ultraviolet would have been detrimental to the origin of life. This belief that ultraviolet radiation is unconditionally lethal to life on Earth has sustained a distorted view of the Archaean, and it is a view still deeply entrenched in scientific thinking. I found it to be common among the scientists who sought life on Mars. I could not help wondering how they could think that there was life on the intensely irradiated surface of Mars and at the same time believe that the land beneath the thick and murky Archean atmosphere of Earth was sterile. How could they fit into their minds two such contrary ideas? Conclusion. It is suggested that experiments in prebiotic chemistry look to how chemicals react to a sun heat UV cycle in ways that lead to life processes as a response to that forced energy. See below for references. Thank you.